It's my pleasure to uh, be chairing this uh, uh, last session of the day. So first with a talk uh, by Lucas Janssen, who is uh, joining us from Dresden, and who will talk about fractionalized fermionic quantum criticality in uh, Kitaev material, Kitaev systems. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the introduction and um, thank you the organizers very much for the invitation and for organizing this extremely interesting workshop. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. I will talk about as announced uh, about fractionalized fermionic quantum criticality, an unconventional type of quantum phase transition in a uh, frustrated magnet, particular between a spin liquid phase. This is work done uh, with various groups, but let me in particular point out Urban Seifert, who was a postdoc in Dresden, uh, now in Santa Barbara, and Siong Liu, um, who is a postdoc uh, within the Würzburg Dresden uh, research cluster uh, within FACES group. So um, this is the outline of the talk. I will start by uh, reviewing the concept of uh, fractionized versus conventional quantum criticality. And then I'll introduce a, a particular class of microscopic models that feature such fractionalized quantum critical points. And that will be a generalization of the spin one half Kita F honeycomb model. And I will argue that this generalization can be understood as some type of spin orbital generalization. I will then discuss um, a phase diagram of this spin orbital model. And I will argue that this uh, hosts a fermionic version of a fractionalized quantum critical point. And, and then I'll conclude. So uh, what do I mean with a fractionalized uh, quantum critical point? Well, uh, when we think of quantum criticality, then often we, we think of this, is this as just a zero temperature version of a classical critical point. And a very well studied example where this quantum to classical map mapping works very well is um, a transfer sheet easing model realized, for example, in some magnetic insulator such as cobalt niobate. When you put it in an external magnetic field, then it features a, a transition between uh, the ordered ferromagnet in that case and, and a field-induced paramagnet. And this transition is uh, described by uh, um, two, uh, two dimensional, so one plus one dimensional easing universality class. The point of this talk is that a quantum critical point in many instances is much more than just a zero temperature version of its classical counterpart in, in one dimension higher. In many cases, there is new kind of physics that, that emerges, which cannot be understood within this simple uh, quantum to classical mapping. And one well-known example for that uh, is, is the deconfined quantum criticality. And, and, and I'll discuss any of these examples in terms of frustrated magnetic systems. So that, that is one example, the deconfined QCP between a, uh, two different types of ordered states. In this case, for example, a nail ordered state and a valence bond solid state. So these uh, two uh, orders uh, break different kinds of symmetries. So if we would uh, just uh, assume uh, the, uh, the usual um, uh, yeah, Lando paradigm that works so, so remar remarkably well for the classical phase transitions, then we would argue that this transition is, is generically either through some intermediate phase or it's discontinuous. However, it has been argued that due to, to some subtle interplay between order parameter fluctuations and topological defects, it is in fact possible that there is a direct continuous transition without any fine tuning. So this in a sense is some unconventional quantum critical point between two completely conventional phases. And this transition is characterized by new fractionalized degrees of freedom and, and these fractionalized degrees of freedom that interact via the emergent gauge field. So this is one example, but there are actually many more. And, and similar unconventional quantum critical points um, uh, can, for, for instance, occur if, if not only the critical point itself, but the whole adjacent phase is characterized by fractionized excitations. So this can be, for example, a quantum spin liquid in a frustrated magnet or, or any other type of topologically ordered phase. So in many cases, uh, these fractionized excitations they become soft at the transition, or, or sometimes they may even be gapless throughout uh, this quantum spin liquid phase. And then that means that this quantum critical point is not only governed by the order parameter fluctuations, but also by the fluctuations of this fractionalized uh, excitations. So we, we know the, denote these as fractionalized quantum critical points, 
And they were actually very similar, uh, have similar characteristics to the uh, deconfined quantum critical points uh, between the conventionally ordered phases. Such type of physics uh, has been discussed uh, in, in terms of some confinement transitions, uh, by which we mean a transition between a, a, a spin liquid deconfined phase and a conventionally ordered phase where uh, the uh, fractionalized excitations are confined. Or that kind of has also been discussed in terms of some liquid liquid transitions um, between, say, two different kinds of spin liquids that are different in, in symmetries or, or in the gauge group. Typically, such type of transitions are extremely hard to describe theoretically um, because the type of the excitations are not really clear. You have a fluctuating gauge field that often induces some sign problem for quantum Monte Carlo. It also renders the usual mean field theory that we like to uh, like to use uh, uncontrolled. And the goal of this talk is to present a microscopic model that overcomes these challenges, that features a fractionalized transition and can be assessed in, in a fully controlled theoretical approach. Um, so we are. So that's that's basically the point to have uh, to have a fractionalized transition in a microscopic model. And I will argue that this is possible in a spin orbital generalization of the Kitaev model. Um, so let me let me uh, take just uh, one slide to review the Kitaev model. Although I know you have already heard uh, very nice talks by by uh, by uh, Natasha and 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 others um, on on the Kitaev uh, Kitaev model, but um, uh, because it is important to understand the generalization. So Kitaev model is a spin one half model on the honeycomb platters. And it features different uh, types of uh, three different types of bonds uh, here in, in in blue and red and green, and you have the uh, easing type of spin-spin uh, so interactions between nearest neighbors. Uh, and the crucial point is that there are these uh, on these three different types of bonds the different quantization axes for this easing axis. And you know that uh, this model can be solved exactly by using a Majorana representation. So that let me review that for a second. Uh, you basically what you do is that uh, you replace your your poly matrices sigma x sigma y and sigma z by products of Majorana operators, and the, the way it is done here is that you basically have four Majorana operators. So these are Hermitian operators that anta commute and square to one, and uh, because you always have this c operator in each of these three terms, you in total have four Majorana operators. So four Majorana operators representing uh, three uh, spin one half matrices, three poly matrices. And that means together with the gauge constraint, uh, that is a fully, you can, uh, you can show that actually uh, with, with, with this gauge constraint, that is a fully faithful representation of the Clifford, uh, uh, sorry, of the, uh, of the SU2 algebra. And, uh, and therefore is, is, it is uh, viable to basically just uh, uh, replace these, these, uh, these sigmas by the products of the, of the Majorana operators. And that is done. And the crucial point is, uh, of course, you when you start with this, uh, you have basic, basic bilinears of the of the poly operators, and then you add them up with quartic terms in Majorana operators. However, uh, two of these can always be combined in the new operator U, and that can be understood as a Z2 gauge. And the crucial point is that this Z2 gauge field still uh, commutes with among each other and commutes with the whole Hamiltonian, meaning that it can be diagonalized simultaneously with a Hamiltonian. And that can be understood as a, Z, a static Z2 gauge field. Uh, static meaning that whenever you're in a sector uh, where these U operators take a particular value, uh, then uh, it remains in this value. So um, then of course, now you have uh, the, the, the ground state, you can, uh, you, you can solve that the ground state is some Z2 spin liquid. And uh, the spectrum of these Majorana, iterant Majorana fermions. So these are these basically these, these C fermions that hop in the background of the static Z2 gauge field. And, and that features this usual Dirac dispersion on Honeycomb lattice. Now, of course, you can ask, okay, now we do have already this spin liquid, and now we want to add some other perturbations because we want to look for a quantum critical point towards some ordered uh, type of phase. Okay. So the first thing you could try to do is add some Heisenberg interaction. And that is of course crucial uh, because in any of these materials where the Kitaev interaction is important, Heisenberg interaction is also allowed by symmetry, of course, uh, has an even higher symmetry and, and then it will be gener genetically present in any of the materials. So, so that's why, uh, as you know, uh, I mean, this Kitaev Heisenberg model has been studied a lot uh, because of possible relevance to the materials. 
And indeed, uh, using exact diagonalization, diagonalization for, for instance, uh, phase diagram has been mapped out. And indeed, of course, there is some uh, finite uh, um, uh, spin liquid regimes, as it must be. And then there are uh, quantum transitions towards, for example, this nil ordered phase if you add some uh, antiferromagnetic Heisenberg coupling uh, beyond a certain threshold. So this would be one of the quantum critical points. You, uh, sorry, the quantum phase transitions you would be interested in. However, the point is, this is done by exact analyzation because uh, anything you can do beyond that is extremely difficult, as you've also heard uh, by, by Farkas talk this morning. The technical challenge can be uh, uh, phrased in, in, for example, can be understood in some sense that whenever you include any of the other, other terms, such as Heisenberg term, you spoil the property that your gauge field remains static. It's no longer the case. So whenever you add this Heisenberg term, and that actually is also true if you add any of the other terms like gamma or gamma prime or J3 or anything like that, then your gauge field is no longer static. And then you have a problem of, of a fluctuating gauge field and, and, and fluctuating fermions and then hell breaks loose. You can, cannot do anything. I mean, you, of course, as you've heard, you could do many things as Fokker explained to you, but it's extremely difficult to point down critical behavior. Um, it's actually not clear still today what's the nature of these transitions. Uh, if any of these transitions possibly continues or not, we don't know. So that's why I would like to uh, propose uh, to, to generalize this model in a way that gives us more freedom to add other types of perturbations that indeed um, allow to um, uh, still keep the gauge field static. And, and that are these spin orbital generalizations. So the idea is that, um, of course, you can, uh, you can um, uh, think of poss different possible generalizations of these two by two polymatrices. For instance, you can think of polymatrices as two-dimensional representation of the Clifford algebra. So then, you know, of course, uh, you can think of higher dimensional representations and gamma matrices are uh, next step then. So the next uh, dimensional representation would be, uh, dimension would be four. So you ha would have four by four gamma matrices where, with which you could replace these, these uh, sigma matrices. Of course, these gamma matrices that can be understood uh, as direct products of sigma matrices. And, and, uh, and, and in that sense, uh, it's a spin orbital generalization. If you think of these sigmas as uh, something uh, acting on spin and these tau operators, which are also uh, poly matrices, as something that act on some orbital index. In fact, in this way, by going to even higher dimensional representations, say eight dimension uh, uh, or, or 16 dimensional representation, you can even uh, realize all 16 type of topological superconductors, the so-called 16 fold way that was mentioned in, 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 in the early uh, Nikita's work. So you can find uh, microscopic models for that. But let me here stick to just these uh, four dimensional representations. Then of course you can write down a model with these gamma terms or uh, equivalently with, with these direct products of, of sigmas and tau. And one possible type of, of uh, Hamiltonian kind of Kitaev uh, inspired Hamiltonian would be something that has this Kitaev type of interaction in the orbital sector. So these would be tau matrices, uh, tau gamma matrices, where again, gamma is X, Y, and Z, and, and, and would be X on the, on the blue bonds, Y on the, on the green bonds, and, and, and Z on the red bonds. And then we also have some interaction uh, between, um, uh, between uh, sigma matrices. And, and yeah, we just chose to, to use this one, which has a high symmetry, as you do symmetry, so kind of Heisenberg interaction in the spin sector. Okay, uh, the point is that we, the way we write down the model here, um, we can choose a representation of uh, these uh, uh, sigma times tau matrices or equivalently gamma matrices in the way that is very similar, analogous uh, to the original Kitaev solution. In fact, now uh, we have, because of, we have a four-dimensional representation of the Clifford algebra, we have five anti-commuting gamma matrices. There are five anti-commuting um, four by four matrices that uh, squared one. And, uh, and that means we can equivalently rewrite this representation of, of, of sigma times tau matrices uh, in terms of now six Majorana operators. And these six I call B1, B2, B3, and Cx, Cy, and Cz. 
Of course, at this point, these all six my one operators are fully equivalent, but uh, I chose the naming such that these B operators, that those will become uh, combined into some U operators, D to H fields, and the C operators, they will become attainment fermions. In fact, by choosing this representation, plugging it into this Hamiltonian, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in a fully analogous way as before, as just some uh, B operators, uh, which are combined into the, the, the Z2H field, the U operators, and some uh, C operators. And the point is that, again, now for the same reason as before, these U op operators, they commute among themselves and also commute with the Hamiltonian. And that means that still the same uh, reason as before, for the same reason as before, uh, we have a static Z2 gauge field, these U op operators. It's the same U operators as before. The only difference to the spin one half Kitta F uh, Honeycomb model is that now we have, we have three types of three flavors, if you like, of itinerant Majoranas. And the point now is that we have one Z2 gauge field that couples all these three flavors. But uh, in the presence or oh, in the background of the static Z2 gauge, so whenever we have chosen a particular flux configuration and in the, uh, in, in the ground state, the, 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 uh, the translation symmetry will not be broken. So it will be flux zero on a honeycomb lattice at least. And, uh, uh, and, and that means that the ground state of this model is basically three flavors of Majorana fermions hopping on the background of the same Z2 gauge flux. So that so far is more or less con uh, completely uh, a simple uh, uh, generalization of, of, of uh, the original Kitta solution. But what's, what's the crucial uh, advantage of this generalization? Well, the point is that uh, with this generalization, we have more freedom to play with perturbations. And in fact, it is possible to uh, have perturbations uh, that still keep the gauge field static and therefore uh, avoid these uh, these problems that we had in the spin one half Kitta F Heisenberg model. So let me call these now the uh, Kitta F Heisenberg spin orbital models. It's kind of the uh, spin orbital generalization, where we add now to this uh, this Kitta F term, uh, this Kitta F type of spin orbital term, we add some other type of perturbation. Of course, you can add many perturbations in theory at least, um, but let me uh, choose this one. And this has been chosen uh, on the one hand because it's simple, it, it looks simple, it's just a acid two invariant uh, perturbation in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the spin sector. So, so in that sense, it's a Heisenberg spin uh, uh, bilinear exchange. Uh, but it is chosen in a way that with the previous representation, that actually turns out to involve only C operative operators. So when we, uh, when we uh, uh, plug the, the Majorana representation, into this uh, perturbation, then actually it turns out that there are only C operators involved. There are no, no B operators and therefore also no U operators. And that means that still this, is there a question? Uh -huh. Okay, if you have any questions, please interrupt, right? So uh, the point here is that still you have the property that uh, U operators commute among themselves and no, commute with them. Yes, please. So what is the constraint in this uh, representation? Uh, just like in Kitta, uh, there is a constraint. It's the same. It's the same constraint that, uh, or a simple generalization that of that the product of the uh, Majorana operators at each site are plus one, right? So uh, the constraint is B, Bx, By, Bz times C equals one, that's in the original spin one half model. And now we not only have C, but CX, CY, and CZ. Oh, thank you. Operators. And that means that these U operators are still static. And that means that now uh, we can understand, uh, there are no fluctuations involved by this, uh, induced by this perturbation, uh, um, uh, even when J is finite. And that means that once we add a strong such perturbation, we can try to uh, obtain uh, already uh, the, the, the phase diagram by, by just um, uh, mean field considerations. Of course, mean field is not still not exact here. 
that's not the, still not the exact solution because of course uh, that's a four fermion interaction if you like and 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 and, and, and that's not, not not solved by mean field theory however it does still not have the property the, the problem that uh, that uh, i mean the main problem in these parton approaches of mean field theory is of course that you have fluctuations of the gauge field but that is not the case here so let's think in first just on mean, on mean field theory level on mean field theory level, uh, you have uh, this this four fermion uh, coupling, if you like, or four Johanna coupling, and you would expect if this perturbation becomes very strong beyond a certain certain threshold, that this bilinear gets vacuum expectation value, and uh, then you can work out what that would mean. In fact, what what that would mean is that on one hand, of course, you have some uh, a nail type of order in the spin sector, and, and that's of course. Uh, uh, of course, uh, very reasonable if you look at, at some positive J. But on the other hand, uh, you still have the Majorana operators. They are not confined by this perturbation because gauge field is static. Uh, and you can, uh, you can look what, what that would mean for the spectrum of these Majorana operators. And you would find out because these L matrices that occur in this decomposition, uh, these are actually spin one matrices. And spin one matrices have a zero eigenvalue. And that means that not all Majorana modes are completely gapped out in the spectrum, but only one out of, sorry, uh, only two out of three are gapped out with one remaining gapless. So out of the three flavors of the Majoranas, uh, two will, uh, uh, will, um, uh, will acquire a gap and one remains gapless. And at the same time, the SO3 uh, flavor rotation symmetry of these Majoranas, uh, they, that will be broken, obviously, as spontaneously broken. So that's the mean field expectation. Uh, so what is really seen in the simulations? And the first thing you could do uh, uh, without yet exploiting uh, the fact that uh, that your gauge field is static, you can check whether it's really true that the gauge field is static. And that is uh, seen here in IDMRG calculations. Um, uh, and, and what you should see in this plot here is actually two curves. Uh, let's focus on the blue curve first. Uh, and you, what is shown here is the, uh, the, the, the value of, of the plaquette operator, which is basically the product of the U operators among plaquette as a function of uh, J over K. So as a function of this perturbation. And what you, the main thing, what you should see here is that you do not see, any, see anything. And that's precisely what you expect because as I said, the gauge field remains static. And that means that there are no fluctuations involved, uh, no fluctuations induced in the, in, in, in the gauge sector. And uh, U operators always remain one up to gauge redundancy. And that means the plaquette operators must remain one, exactly one. But then also you can look at the, at the black curves, the black point. And what is, uh, what is the black point is basically the antiferromagnetic order parameter. And that uh, shows uh, a transition between something that is consistent with a symmetric phase, also order parameter zero, and, a and, and, and an ordered phase where the order parameter is finite. So that, the, the, the picture that emerges here is really a continuous, uh, sorry, yeah, well, yes, more or less continuous transition uh, as, as far as I can say on this DMRG. Uh, I'll say more about that soon. Um, quantum phase transition, direct quantum phase transition between symmetric Kitaev type of spin orbital liquid with three gapless Majorana cones and a uh, SO3 ordered uh, antiferromagnetic uh, 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 liquid where one of, of the cones uh, still remains gapless. You can then even work out uh, what would be the field theory for this transition if it is really continuous uh, and, and you could do some gradient expansion. And what you find, of course, because of these gapless degrees of freedom, you uh, have uh, um, uh, um, gapless Majoranas uh, because of fermion doubling, you can combine these into Dirac fermions, complex fermions in the field theory. And you end up with three flavors of gapless Dirac fermions that are coupled uh, um, uh, via some uh, Yukawa type of interaction if you do some appropriate hubbard strong Chernovich transformation. And these types of field theories have been discussed uh, a lot in the literature in, in different contexts, uh, some kind of graphene contexts uh, in, in the past. Uh, but again, uh, that's not the same field theory and, and, um, as, as this usual gross number type of field theories, because now you have spin one matrices involving in this uh, Yukawa bilinear. 
and and then uh, again that means that uh, um, the spectrum is not fully gapped out by the um, uh, by the condensation of this order parameter field phi. But besides that, it's uh, fu fully similar to uh, the other Grassmann type of field theories. And uh, you can even try to um, uh, uh, do some lar uh, large n or uh, high order epsilon expansion even and to, to estimate the critical behavior. And indeed, this field theory does have a quantum critical point. Uh, it does have a fixed point, uh, and uh, that would describe precisely this quantum critical point. So the question is um, now, um, can you even do better than that? Can you, uh, because as I said, uh, uh, now uh, the gauge field, uh, gauge field uh, is static all the time. A plaquette operator always remains one. Uh, there's no, no vortices that are uh, in a low energy spectrum. Um, can you now do uh, quantum Monte Carlo simulations without any uh, quantum, uh, quantum Monte Carlo sign problem? Um, and, and the idea is now we only look at the low energy sector of the spectrum. Uh, we throw away the gauge field because it is gapped and static, and we only look at the low energy fluctuations. So we write down now a, uh, an effective model uh, and uh, that, that only involves these fluctuations of the fractionalized fermions. And um, that, that was done in, in collaboration with Fakas group and in particular with Si Hong Liu. And uh, that, that's the model basically that we came up with. Uh, this is a model uh, now uh, on, on, on a bilayer that's basically um, uh, in, in some sense uh, a double version of what we had earlier. The reason being that this has a higher symmetry and that, that uh, avoids, turns out to avoid the, the, the same problem. Um, but uh, the crucial point is that uh, this, this model has, has again these spin one matrices which means that if this perturbation here or this interaction parameter that, that in, in involves this bilinear, if this bilinear gets a vacuum expectation value, that again breaks this SO3 symmetry, uh, uh, this, this flavor, uh, flavor rotation symmetry in a way that only one third of the uh, spectrum is kept out, at least on the mean field picture. And that's something we'd like to check. And now um, uh, Siong has done uh, extensive um, quantum Monte Carlo simulations on that model. And uh, here is, uh, in, is kind of the summary of, of, of these results. Um, what is shown is now the structure factors for two different types of orders. And let us look, first look at the triangles. So uh, these, these are different triangles. Uh, that's the SO3 order parameter, the SO3 structure factor for different system sizes. So uh, what you should see here is that there is a weakly interacting phase. And in this weakly interacting phase, the, uh, the, the simulations are consistent with a symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, semi-metal. Uh, semi and that's, of course, what would be expected on honeycomb lattice. If you have uh, hopping fermions on a honeycomb lattice at half filling uh, and only weak interactions, of course, you have a stable semi-metallic phase. However, if you now increase your interactions beyond a certain threshold, so uh, uh, beyond something like 0.45, then what you find here is that um, your yes. SO3 structure factor uh, Lucas, increases Lucas. with system size. Yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, you may not have heard me, but actually you, we were offline for the past two, one minute or two. Oh, sorry for that. Okay. Uh, so uh, we okay. essentially we we heard you until you present introduced Hamiltonian, and uh, but we okay. Okay. Uh, uh, we haven't heard anything about the figure you're showing right now. Okay. So let me let me uh, let me show uh, uh, discuss that again. <laughs> um, so uh, let let's look at the um, let's look at the uh, triangles first. So th this figure shows QMC structure factors as a function of this interaction parameter J. Um, uh, and, and basically two different types of structure factors. And let's look at the triangles first, which is the SO3 structure factor. So you can think of that as an order parameter for this SO3 order. From the mean field theory, we expect that SO3 order is generated above a certain threshold. And that is precisely what is seen here. Uh, if, if, if J is increased um, uh, beyond something like 0.45, then in this phase, what you find here 
is that the structure factor increases with system size and in fact diverges with system size. And that means that there's SO3 order for J above 0.45. However, if you increase, further increase J, then what you find here is that actually the SO3 order decreases again. And beyond something like J equals one, uh, there is no SO3 order. Instead, there's some other structure factor, and, and we call this kind of interlayer coherence, that corresponds to a bilinear uh, that couples the two different layers, so C dagger one, C two, where one and two are the layer indices. So beyond J equals one, there is this interlayer coherence structure factor, and, and, and that uh, corresponds to some U1 order that increases with system size. And that means now we have three phases, actually, a semi-metallic phase for, for small j, that's the usual Dirac semi-metal on, 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 on honeycomb platters. Then an SO3 ordered phase, where we expect from the mean field theory that only two thirds of the uh, spectrum is gapped out at low energy. And then a fully gapped phase where a different symmetry is broken. So this, uh, this phase here that breaks SO3 symmetry, while this phase here that breaks a U1 symmetry. So that's basically the picture that emerges here. Yeah, a symmetric semi-metallic phase, uh, uh, an SO3 ordered still semi-metallic phase, and then a fully gapped phase. In, in order to show you that this is indeed consistent with the numerical data here, uh, let me show uh, plots of the fermion spectral function. And uh, um, here you really see that uh, at the K point, you have these Dirac cones then part of the spectrum is, is lifted, uh, 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 so spectral density um, in this intermediate phase, and then it's fully gapped uh, uh, spectrum in the um, strongly interacting phase. And not only qualitatively, but even quantitatively, this is consistent with the idea that one third of the spectrum remains gapless. Uh, that is shown here uh, for the quasi-particle weight, uh, the blue, triangles are in the symmetric phase and, and these uh, red triangles are in the, uh, in the um, uh, quasi-particle weight in the intermediate phase, in the SO3 ordered phase. And for the thermodynamic limit, which is kind of here, you, that is at least consistent with uh, one third of the spectrum uh, being, uh, being still remaining gapless. So we can then uh, try to, uh, because now uh, we have really thrown away the gauge field uh, because it's gapped and static. And uh, we can uh, now uh, try to estimate the critical behavior because now we do not have any sign problem. That's the crucial point of this model. This model does not have a sign problem. So we can go to large system sizes or Sihong can go to large system sizes. And what is shown here is the correlation ratio as a function of J uh, on, on the left-hand side as a function of J itself, but then on the right-hand side, uh, some reduced uh, J uh, 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 appropriately rescaled with some power of L. And what is shown is that this is really consistent uh, with, uh, with, with a continuous transition because you get a fairly good data collapse. And from that, you can even extract your, your critical exponent. And you can also uh, try to uh, attempt the sa same kind of scaling collapse for your order parameter, again, for some appropriate, for the same uh, appropriately rescaled a reduced coupling, again, there's some scaling collapse. So this is really now a continuous transition um, in, in, in this effective model between a, uh, a symmetric phase, the Dirac semi-metallic phase, and another semi-metal where this SO3 is or uh, SO3 symmetry is broken. However, we've seen that there's even yet another uh, transition between uh, now this SO3 semi-metallic phase and this other fully gapped phase where, um, uh, uh, where, where a different uh, symmetry is broken, a U1 symmetry. Note that this U1 symmetry is not part of, of the remaining uh, SO3 symmetry, but it's really different symmetry. It's a, a symmetry that relates uh, the, the different layers. So these are really different, two different types of orders. So on the mean field level, you would expect that there must be either some uh, um, a strong first order transition or uh, some intermediate phase from Landau paradigm. That's what you, what you would expect. However, uh, the data and, and what is shown is here some correlation ratios, but uh, it's also seen in, in, the, in the correlation length 
is not consistent with a strong first order transition. A transition is if it is first order is really weakly first order. And not only that, um, if we extract the critical uh, couplings as a function of one over L, uh, and there are two different critical couplings, the critical couplings on, on one hand, uh, where this uh, SO3 order uh, vanishes, and the second critical, the other critical coupling would be the coupling where this U1 order develops. And what you find is that this, uh, this, this uh, SO3 critical coupling is in the thermodynamic limit uh, the same uh, as, as the U1 coupling. So they, they are consistent to converge to the same value and actually this value turns out to be very close to one. So that means there is no strong, at least no strong first order transition. And there's also uh, up to the numerical precision, no intermediate phase. And that, that means is, this is really a transition that is beyond the Landau paradigm, that's inconsistent with the Landau paradigm. So if this were a usual bosonic transition without any gapless firmness, you would call this a decod fine point to critical point. Uh, if this is really a continuous transition that's direct and without any fine tuning between two different types of waters. However, here is really a new version of thereof because not only uh, we do have this uh, uh, bosonic, gapless bosonic degrees of freedom, but also it's uh, this SO3 phase is really a metallic phase. It's a semi-metallic phase. So they're really gapless fermionic degrees of freedom. So in that sense, it's an insta instance of a metallic type of deconfined quantum critical point. So let me conclude. Um, I've presented you um, uh, two types of uh, microscopic models and everything is kind of related to this uh, microscopic Kitaev type of spin orbital model. And I've argued that this model features a fractionalized fermionic version of a quantum critical point uh, in the Gros Nouveau SO3 uh, star universality class. The crucial point of this uh, model is that the gauge field remains static, and therefore, actually, the model is amenable to a uh, sign problem free quantum Monte Carlo simulations, at least an effective version thereof. And we have introduced such an effective uh, uh, model, and indeed, it, this effective model features such a transition, but it also features another uh, transition, a second transition that appears to be continuous as well. And if, if that turns out to be true beyond uh, what we've computed here and beyond the data that it's, we, we've seen, that would be really the, as, we, as far as we're aware, the first microscopic realization of a metallic kind of deconfined quantum critical point, a deconfined QCP in the presence of gapless fermionic degrees of freedom. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And thank you for being on time. We have time for, so, André? Uh, once again, I apologize for, I, I didn't understand most of your talk due to my own failings, but uh, I was very intrigued by this order to order continuous transition. Uh, are there examples of any materials that realize a continuous order to order transition from one broken symmetry to a different one and a continuous one, not necessarily your types of system. Yeah, so um, we're not aware of these uh, of these metallic systems. Uh, the, uh, oh, oh, sorry, we're not aware of any materials real, realizing the spin orbital generalizations, but there has been actually um, works uh, uh, on 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 some um, some frustrated two dimensional magnets, um, spin one half magnets. Uh, that are believed to realize a, um, uh, a, a, a bos the bosonic version thereof, the original uh, deconfined quantum critical point. And um, I'm, I'm not aware of the specific compound, I must, uh, I must say, but uh, I'm aware that, uh, that um, Anders Sandwick uh, has, has uh, collaborated with some experimentalists on that. So um, if... Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure that could, could be found out, found out quite easily if, if one Googles for Anders, Anders papers. Thank you very much, then. So I, I can just say that I'm rather puzzled by some thermodynamic data we had on a frustrated chain system, couple chain system recently, where there was a dome of a magnetically ordered phase and a very neat quantum critical point was this typical V 
of quantum fluctuations above the critical point inside the ordered phase. So I'll write you and uh, send you send you. A oh yes, yeah. that would be great. Yes, yes, I'd be happy to continue the discussion. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, do we? So maybe you already uh, explained this, but maybe I missed it. In your first model, the SO3 Kitaev liquid, the spins order and the orbital orbitals are liquid, or what, what is the liquid part there? Aha, uh -huh. okay, yes. Um, let me move back there. Um, so um, that's basically this phase diagram, right? Yes. Um, so, so the the liquid part is really the orbital sector. So uh, you you can think of this as uh, uh, where do I have the Hamiltonian? Um, I'll go back here. So if you, if you think of some perturbation theory for strong J and infinitesimally but small J, then uh, then of course for a very strong J, you you just have uh, so for infinite J, if you like, you just have these sigma uh, sigma terms, uh, uh, spin spin um, uh, kind of a spin 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 uh, spin spin bilinears, and you would expect some antiferromagnetic order, and then you add a per, add this K term as a perturbation, and because this term is really uh, a neg uh, th these are just one matrices, I mean identity matrices, these these doesn't this term doesn't really care. What um, uh, what uh, what what the orbitals really do? Uh, you can just think of this as a Kitaev version uh, of just the orbital sector. So what what this really is is an n equals one uh, Kitaev orbital liquid. It's an orbital only liquid, no spin liquid, but an orbital liquid. Right, right. So if I come from the paramagnetic state and I cool down, how how do I see the fractionalization? How do, do the uh -huh. spins break up? Or? Uh, so, you, sorry, you, you come from high temperatures or, yeah, yes. you cool down, yeah. So, um, what, so there, there are two types of things I would expect. First one is, um, well, um, you, you should see uh, some, something as in the original, uh, original Kitaev model, uh, spin one half Kitaev model, some uh, some type of uh, um, I mean there have been lots of lots of numerics actually on 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 spin one half only uh, Kitaev model right at at finite temperatures that that is uh, something as well known so you have this fractionalization um, for in that case then the orbitals instead of of, of the spins but uh, I think for the um, uh, for for the spectrum or something like that it, it should should look similar okay and then of course for this yeah. And then, of course, for the spins, you should you, you should see some anti strong antiferromagnetic fluctuations. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucas, for this very nice, interesting talk.